So um, first of all, I want to thank everybody for joining us um, for this discussion of the Inflation Reduction Act and what comes next. So just to give you a little bit of a feel for how things are going to go to this morning, um, I'm going to run through for you some a brief overview of exactly what we're talking about. And then Steve and I are going to have a discussion from the economic and also from the innovator perspective on some of the things that you're going to learn about in the first half of this program. Again, thank you everyone for joining us this morning. And um, we're going to be talking about not just what the Inflation Reduction Act is now that it is law and it was signed by the president on August the 16th of this year, um, but what comes next. So the first thing, no discussion on this topic is appropriate without you know, remembering what they were trying to accomplish. We are an industry that exists to make life better for patients. And if our patients cannot afford or access the life-saving and life-changing innovations that we create, then you have to kind of wonder what is the point. So as we talk about the Inflation Reac um, Reduction Act, and there's been a lot of discussion on both sides, um, both parties, industry, patient groups, et cetera, let's try and keep in mind that as we look at these policies and as we discuss how we can improve these policies, um, patients have to come first. That, if that is our guiding principle, then how we innovate and how we shape policy, hopefully we'll move in the right direction. So what is in the IRA? Um, so first of all, from our seniors, the IRA um, significantly expands Medicare benefits. So free vaccines um, go into effect in 2023. Now, many of you say, well, wait a minute, vaccines were free before. Um, they are for things like flu shots. They aren't for things like shingle shots. And as we're developing new vaccines for things like RSV, um, that's very important for our seniors. And because the large majority of cancer patients are seniors, many of the therapies that and treatments that we use to try and save their lives or extend their lives um, wipes out the immune system which means that they have to go back and get shots that most of us got when we were kids. Those vaccines are now covered also. So it's very, very important um, that we think about, you know, what are the things we are doing, use, utilizing our current health innovations to make life better for seniors. So that is an improvement. Insulin. A large majority of our population, our Medicare population, um, lives because of their insulin. So it caps insulin just on Medicare, not on Medicaid or other plans, just on Medicare at $35 a month starting in 2023. The out-of-pocket caps, which have been a big discussion um, with groups like AARP and others, um, the out-of-pocket caps um, will start to reduce in 2024 and get down to roughly 2,000, and that will vary based on a lot of different factors, but roughly 2,000 in 2025. So those are good things for our seniors. And as somebody that just turned 62, okay, Medicare is becoming a lot more important to me too. So how does it look in Arizona? So we just talked about what some of those things are. So the free vaccines, um, the estimate is that that impacts over 30,000 Arizonans um, in any given year. 
um, the $35,000 or $35 a month insulin will impact, according to the White House, 63,000 Arizonans. Um, the White House fact sheet is referenced on these slides, which I will be happy to provide to people later. Um, and then the out-of-pocket drug caps. You know, how many Arizonans actually hit that cap? Well, in 2020, it was 32,000. So that gives you an idea just here at home how many people we're talking about. The other thing that's important in the IRA that did not get as much attention is that it continues the American Rescue Plan subsidies for the marketplace plans and the Medicaid expansion, um, which again is very significant in the state of Arizona. Um, it was estimated that um, we would lose about 41,000 people off of those plans if they did not get extended. So again, if you don't have care, um, or you don't have access to care because you don't have insurance, then all of a sudden your principal care provider is the emergency room. And we all end up paying for that. So it's very, very important that, you know, as we look at these things, it is not just improvements um, for seniors, but also for many of our populations that rely on the Affordable Care Act plans, i.e. the marketplace plans, um, or were benefiting from Medicaid extens expansion because that would have expired. Okay, so that's a lot of money. And the big conversation in DC is Who's paying for this? It does not just impact the Affordable Care Act. It doesn't just impact the Inflation Reduction Act. It does not just, it, it the deficit, all the spending. The chicken littles in Washington, D.C. are going to tell you that the sky is falling. And the challenge is that the more we say that the sky is falling, the less people listen, right? We all learned the story of Chicken Little when we were children. And so the answer is for all of these programs in Washington, D.C., in one way or another, we, the people, are paying for it. And then in some very specific ways for specific programs, because of some rules that exist in Washington, D.C. that we're going to talk about, um, as an industry, certain provisions we are going to pay for. So let's talk about those provisions just a little bit, because if you don't spend a lot of time looking at the policy stuff, and many of you are small businesses and you don't have time to go through a lot of this, I want to just kind of focus on two rules that really were important as this policy was shaped. Um, the first one is called the, the pay-as-you-go rule, or as what most of us on the Hill call it, the pay-go rule, okay? And it encourages, and I'm going to emphasize the word encourages, <laughs> um, Congress to offset the cost of any legislation that increases spending on entitlement programs or reduces revenue so it doesn't expand the deficit. As we go through that process, um, it starts to shape the horse trading that goes on in Washington, D.C. If I'm going to spend more money here, how do I take, more mon take money out over there? Now, as many of you know, the Inflation Reduction Act was done through reconciliation. The reconciliation is a process where you need just a simple, ma a simple majority of 51 votes um, to pass something. And that falls under something called the Bird Rule. And the Bird Rule has a number of different provisions, but the number one provision in the Bird, in the bird Rule, that is, it does not produce a change in the outlays or revenues. So what that means is it's got to be in balance, okay? If you're going to spend money on one side, you have to pay for it on the other side in some way. So let's just briefly go over 
you know, some of the things that were in the Inflation Reduction Act. Um, so, number one, um, the energy security and climate change provisions in that act were $369 billion. The Western Drought Resiliency Provision, that's us, $4 billion. The, as the rest of the money is all for these health provisions. So where is that money coming from? Because we're talking about $737 billion, with B, dollars, um, in revenue, i.e. pay-fors, um, that are tied to this piece of legislation. So the 15% mil 15 corporate minimum tax, that applies to all companies that are over the income threshold, which is currently a billion dollars a year, um, is anticipated to raise $222 billion over the 10-year period. The prescription drug pricing reform, $265 billion, i.e. our industry is paying for that. The IRS tax enforcement is estimated to increase revenue by $124 billion. The 1% penalty for companies that do stock buybacks, $74 billion, and loss limitation extensions, um, $52 billion. So basically, these are the provisions that they put into this law to pay for the things that we're doing for seniors, the things that we're doing for ACA and Medicare, or Medicaid, and the things we're doing for the environment. Now, unlike the federal government, industry and corporations are not allowed to print money, which means that when we have this pay for, it is being paid for by that taxpayer. Think about that for a minute. So specifically, and I'm not going to do the estimates on how the other provisions will impact our industry because it, it's too complicated to get into in an hour. Um, but let's just look strictly at the prescription drug pricing reform portion of that. And keep in mind that the estimate is that the government will save $265 billion which means that $265 billion in what are otherwise known as profits will disappear from the industry. Now, there may be people listening out there that says, well, my company's not profitable. I'm glad they can afford to pay that. But keep in mind that those funds that go into those corporations are the same funds that pay for research and development. So if we take $265 billion out of the ecosystem, we are reducing the available funding for research and development for improving current treatments and cures or developing new treatments and cures. And it is those treatments and cures that actually ultimately lead us to lower health care costs because it helps us keep people healthy and keep them out of the hospital, which is where the greatest level of health care spending takes place. So what is exactly in the act? And I, it, it, it's 755 pages, folks. So what I've got here for you is a shorter version just to kind of give you a feel of what the key provisions are. And then as we move forward, Steve and I are going to talk about that in the second half hour. So the big savings that they are projecting is going to come from drug price negotiation. Now, um, many of you will say, oh, the Democrats did this. 
well, the Democrats did get this done. Um, but just to be fair, there have been similar provisions of how to do this in both Republican and Democratic administrations for over a decade. This just finally got to the finished one. So the key things to keep in mind are that um, it's going to impact Medicare Part D, so drugs, in t starting in 2026, and Part B, think biologics, and infused medications, hospital-applied delivered medications, starting in 2028. So that sounds like it's far away. It's not. It's already having an impact in discussions, as we're going to talk about a little bit later. Um, under the new program, the number of drugs that will be negotiated, that will go into negotiated pricing in 2026 is 10. Then it's 15 more. Then it's 20 more. And it's anticipated that eventually we will get up to 100 drugs. That's where those numbers are coming from. So I wanted to give you, and this is actually a um, image that was created by the Kauffman Foundation, and I chose to use Kauffman as opposed to bios or pharmas or media or whatever, um, specifically because they're kind of in the middle, right? They are focusing on the, um, you know, the, the facts of how this is playing out, and we would hope are, are a little less slanted than either side of the continuum. Um, but what you need to understand is, while it doesn't go into effect until 2026, um, the drugs that are being selected for negotiation, they're working on that right now, and it's going to be announced in 2023. So the companies that make the drugs that are in the top 50 that don't fall under the exclusion rules, which we're going to talk about in a minute, um, they have a pretty good idea of who they are, and they are already adjusting their behavior accordingly because they're going to have to figure out how they pay for what they're going to provide to the government in the government pay for savings. So the negotiation process will begin in October for the people that have been notified by the secretary of the HHS. Um, that negotiation process will go until August of 2024, the maximum fair prices, and we will talk about that in a minute, um, will be published in September of 24, and then they go into effect in 2026. And then you can see below for the drugs that are, and, and these will all be drugs, okay, um, so small molecules, these will all, um, you can see the timeline of, of how it will play out in 2027 and then it will go on from there. Keep in mind that each year, the pool of medicines that are going to be negotiated gets bigger. So I mentioned exclusions. So which ones are in the safe zone? Which um, therapies, okay, um, that are not going to be included. So number one, drugs that have a generic or a biosimilar on the market, they are available. Do not fall in that because in theory, the market is going to do that, that price. Um, drugs that are less than nine years for small molecule or 13 years for biologics from their FDA approval or licensure date. So that you're gonna, you're gonna hear Steve and I talking about nine and 13. This is what people are talking about. It's the 9 and 13 exclusion. Small biotech drugs. So up between now and 2029, not forever, okay, are defined as those that are less than 1% or less of Part D of, um, and then accounting for 80% or more spending under each part of the manufacturer's drug. So those quote unquote small, the specialty drugs, um, have are in a safe zone until 2029. 
Uh, Medicare spent drugs with Medicare spending of less than two hundred million dollars in twenty twenty one, and that will be increased by the the consumer price in, um, index um, in subsequent years. But what they're looking at there again is quote unquote the the small specialty markets. Drugs that have an orphan designation as their only FDA approved indication. So, for instance, very often you'll see that a, a new medicine will come out, whether it's a drug or a biologic, um, as an orphan, but then it gets expanded into other indications. Once you expand into other indications, uh, you're out of the safe zone. And the legislation will also delay um, selection of any biologics for ne negotiation if it's anticipated that the biosimilar will have FDA approval and it will be on the market within two years. Okay, now we're going to talk about the fair maximum price. So the fair maximum price is the upper limit of the negotiated price, i.e. that's the cap. Um, it will be the weighted average. It's going to be, it's a very complex negotiation that will go on between the innovator and um, HHS. Um, but in general, it's 75% cap on small molecules, 65% for drugs that are, 75% for um, products that are between 9 and 12 years beyond approval, 65% between 12 and 16, 40% reduction, 16 and beyond. So basically, if you're in that top 10, 15, 25, 100, these are the new rules. Now, Part D drugs that have a maximum fair price are required to be covered by all Part D plans. So on one side, they are arguing that um, yes, we're going to reduce your 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 prices, but we are going to require all of the Part D plans to make them available for patients. Medicare's payment to providers for Part B is going to continue to be at the Medicaid plus the Medicare plus six. However, they're going to lower the price of the Part B drug or, or therapeutic, which means that what the actual physicians, hospitals, infusion centers, et cetera, are going to net will be less. And in some cases where, especially in rural and smaller communities, um, that may have an impact on access to care if they can no longer afford to provide that service. Okay, and then this is this is the one that we really um, you know made people stand up and notice. Okay, if you don't play, you pay. Your choices are you negotiate and follow these um, new negotiated prices, maximum fair price rules, or they will hit you with an excise tax starting at 65% of your sales in the United States, and then it will increase by 10% every quarter until it gets to 95%. Think about that. That's an excise tax. That is off the top, which means that you can no longer sell that product in the United States. And um, you do have the alternative. You can say, I'm not going to pay that tax. But then you can no longer provide them to Medicare or Medicaid beneficiaries. So. Short answer is, you do not have a choice, except to exit the market. So 
So that is the Inflation Reduction Act. Um, again, it is doing really important things for patients, especially our seniors and our disadvantaged. It is helping our small businesses, many of them who rely on the Affordable Care Act coverage plan in the marketplace. But the costs in the way the pay fors are structured are going to have long-term unintended consequences. And now I am going to stop sharing and I am going to invite back Mr. Potts, who needs to turn his camera back on. Welcome back, Steve. Thank you. That was, uh, I have to admit, I didn't read very much of those 755 pages. And there's some points you made that kind of leave my jaw even more open than it was before. So, so and, and I do want to go back to the summary that I just shared with you um, was subsetted from the Kauffman Foundation summary. So this was not, you know, pharma saying the sky is falling, bio saying the sky is falling. This was Kauffman. Yeah. I mean, if you just pause for a minute and say you literally, the default fine would be 65% of your product revenue. I mean, it's just... Like, That's what an excise tax is in the United States. Now, anyway. you can sell in Canada, you can sell in um, China, but in the United That's, States, you excise. The market. United States built the pharma industry and continues to build, basically build and fund the pharma industry. I mean, I I've been doing this for twenty years, and I have yet to to really seriously put develop a European, Asian, or, or other other rest of world business plan that anybody even looks at. It's always how many U.S. patients, what's the price per patient, it's U.S. market. So okay. that's the reality we're dealing with. And we should be proud of it. In some ways, we should be proud of that. It, it's, it's, but I mean, the reality is the U.S. market dictates how drugs are going to be developed for the whole world. That's correct. And um you know, it's interesting, if you go back and um, look at where the great innovations were coming from 40, 50 years ago, it was not the United States. It was Europe. Hmm. Our innovation centers um, and the, the new and amazing innovations that we have um, really started here in the United States to blossom as in Europe, um, they started putting price restrictions on their innovation and innovators, not dissimilar to these. Now, they work in a different way. They have managed care systems, right? Universal health care. Um, and so they are single payer systems. And so they negotiated single payer. Um, and again, it comes down to if you don't play, you don't, you, you don't get, you know, if you don't play by their rules, you don't play. And so that's why in the United States, the newest drugs for patients usually come out here first. It is why um, we have access to more life-changing and life-saving innovations than other Western countries. So when we start to put limits on it, um, well, looking through the patient lens, remember what I said at the beginning, we, we always have to look through the patient lens. How many patients are waiting for a life-changing or life-changing saving therapy that's not gonna get to them in time? That's what keeps me up at night. And so as we continue to go through this, it's very important that we say, 
okay, let's look at what we need to do, which is help the patients to afford their medicines, but also to get the medicines that they're waiting for. And so as we have this innovator discussion, let's talk about some of the provisions that um, probably could use some work. And I think one, um, when Nick Shipley from Bio was here last month, um, that we talked about was the 9 and 13 provision, yeah. right? So again, just to remind everyone, right, you're in a safe zone for nine years if you are a drug and you're in the safe zone for 13 years if you're a biologic. That is where Nick Shipley and I discussed, we both think that we're gonna see the impact on innovation first as investors who pay for the innovation process. Look at those numbers. Steve, what are you hearing? Yeah, so I mean, I'm, I'm pretty practical. I'm, I'm currently fundraising for two entities. One that I'm planned to, you know, run as full-time CEO, which is a small molecule, and it probably it's cancer drugs. Every every cancer drug is an elderly drug. Period. You know, and there, even if you're going after a rare pediatric indication, you're you're not going to you're not going to survive as an entity on that. You're, everybody doing cancer development is developing drugs for the elderly. Um, period. And then the second is a biologic. Um, so it's kind of interesting. I'm pretty, I'm pretty practical. I mean, I certainly didn't sit and read through the whole legislation. I wasn't, I, I followed it a little bit. I wasn't paying a huge amount of attention until I, you know, and, until you start to talk to some of the top VC firms who really are running the numbers on this and really thinking carefully, what does this mean if I invest 50, 100 million, 150 now? you know, in terms of, of getting an appropriate return. And, you know, and it isn't just a return. You have to do this if you're going to end up with a drug that's going to that's gonna affect patients, it's going to get there. And um, pretty strong message back that even in the pitch decks, you know, on the confidential pitch decks, you need to have a, you need to have thought this through and, and show that you're thinking about it. Um, I didn't get that from the biologics as much because the 13 years, it's, it's tight, but it's not as bad as the nine years. And um, you know, just some some background there. I mean, I came off of a a company that developed one, um, a, you know the second Trek drug um, just approved right after the first Trek drug. These are amazing drugs that kind of are. I mean, if you Google cure for cancer, you'll see TRK drugs, and they're only appropriate for a small percentage of the population that has a certain um, fusion. But you know, they're some of the best, highest response rate cancer drugs we've ever. It's really the industry's ever invented, um, per, perhaps outside of BCR able, and. That was a small molecule battle. You know, we fought that kind of tooth and nail with another company that was at, that was really at the same page at the same time as us. And while that's hard, we're in the trenches doing that. It was a huge reflection on how well competition works um, in drug development, and especially in the small molecule area. So two of us got approved within about a year of each other, and now there's a third company that should be reaching approval um, turning point um, in about. I would guess in you know, the next year or so. So you've got three small molecule drugs all approved for a rare indication, you know, super high response rates, you know, just shrink cancers as soon as you take them. Um, and, you know, in a period of three years. So the system worked. I mean, our drug was actually priced half of what the competitor drug was priced. Um, other, other scenarios came into play there. But you know, I saw that, I saw the system work. And I I, I think what 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 worries me is that I've I've been I've done biologics and I've I've been worked on small molecules and the small molecules just with and it isn't it's nine years from the time that you get your first approval so you know we, we typically when you business plan you're you're talking to investors about the life of the drug from the time that you file your patent so we think hard about that you know and in small molecules there's really there's not that many ways to um to extend that patent life you do a little bit but but it's pretty limited biologics has a lot more ways and you know and frankly i would like to see the biosimilar industry get um and strengthen it it's, this bill is not going to do that it's gonna it's gonna hurt the biosimilars um that's another topic but in small molecules you really don't have um a lot of a, a lot of creative ways you can kind of gain the system so you have to put in you have to, you know, the investment of small molecules has to be in new and better molecules, which is exactly what the patent system is supposed to do. Um, you know, so I, I've seen how well I, I think small molecule technology works. Um, 
and and how well I think the patent system does work. I mean, you recover your costs, but it's always from the date of the first issuance of the patent, and then you have 20 years. Now there's another a, a new force at play, which is basically from the date where you get your first approval. So if you start thinking about that, it actually changes. I, I've had to rethink um, the how we approach a we have we have a really interesting approach with this with this new company Red Rock, where it's a precision oncology. So there's a lot of different ways to attack a lot of different cancer types, and that could be elderly cancers, it could be um, other other areas of cancer. But you, there's a lot of different approaches you can take in terms of how you get approval. And so you're always thinking about kind of which patient population to go after. Do I go after a small number of patients or do I go after a huge number of patients? Um, and, and typically the way the system works and it works really well is you look for an approval in a, you know, a limited number of patients. You might get an orphan label, you might get rare disease, but you, um, you get an approval there and then you kind of expand out, which is just Good business in anything you're doing. You you get you you get one set of customers. You figure out how well you know the product works, and then you build on that and go after other areas. But you know if you think about this as all of that is disincentivized now because you're going to get that one shot and the clock starts ticking from the time that you get your approval, and you have nine years. Um, and so. You don't want to be, you really just, there's a, there's a lot of things coming to play. I mean, it's actually amazing when you really sit down and, and think how much of an impact this has on small molecular drug development. It it almost doesn't end. And I, I find that I have to limit discussion because, I mean, the whole goal here is to show how much better your drug is, not to not to have a, a an exercise in complicated financial modeling. Um, but the you really don't want to have your first indication be a be a, a limited population. You want to actually go after your biggest um, opportunity you have because you know there's no point five years into it. You've been selling only a four years left to do the innovation to go after new areas because you're going to get you're going to get such strong price control on it. So there's just I mean it, when you start really thinking about what this is going to do with a nine year cliff. Um, it, it really is going to have an impact on small molecules. And I am already having discussions. I've heard things of, of um, you know, in terms of, you know, there's a, there's a, a model that, that any good VC will use to, to look at the return and they look at how much selling time. And, you know, I've, I've seen some models cut it by 40 percent, um, 50 percent. It just kind of depends. But I, if you're out, if you're, if you're working in small molecules and you're working in cancer, which, again, is a disease of the elderly, um, you know, you, you need to be aware of how this is going to impact you because um, the, the, the savvy, the top echelon VCs absolutely have ver very smart people that are looking at this and um, and are, are sharing the concern that I think the innovators have. So it's interesting. You you talk about the top VCs, and you know, for for those of us on this call and, and for those watching, you know, the continuum of developing a life-changing or life-saving life therapy doesn't start with the VCs. No. And it doesn't end with the VCs. It starts with the angel investors, the small um, family, you know, investors, the family offices, the charitable foundations, um, that are now investing in the riskiest enterprises that you can invest in, which is health innovation. Um, many of you know, you know, my career has been kind of long, right? It extends now, it's kind of scary, you know, into the fourth decade. Um, actually, I'm approaching my fifth decade. And I look at the investments that that have played out over time. And the reality is, is that in the life sciences, the vast majority of the early stage investments fail. Okay. Sometimes it wasn't a great idea. Sometimes somebody got to market faster. But more often than not, it fails because it was a great idea and the science didn't play out. That happens, right? It looked great in the mouse model. It didn't work in the people model. And so those early stage investors rely on the food chain. So the investment food chain looks like this. 
It's the innovator with the great idea that puts skin in the game. It moves to the angel investor who's now starting to hear all of this stuff about how the VCs are getting very skittish and so they get skittish. It moves to the venture, the, the larger angels, the super angels, the family offices who can write bigger checks to continue that process. It then moves on to the VCs that start writing checks that are not thousands of dollars, but millions of dollars and tens of millions of dollars, and in some cases, hundreds of millions of dollars. Then, if it's truly going to be one of those global success stories, more often than not, it's going to have to be acquired by a strategic investor. It's going to get bought by a Pfizer or a Novartis or a Roche or someone else. But... We just took $265 billion of potential investments out of that workout. So investors downstream in the investment food chain are looking at that and saying, if the exits may not be there when I get this drug to market 10, 15, 20 years from now, Maybe I'll put my money in something else. That's what these discussions are starting to percolate with. It's not just the big VCs. It's at every level of the investment food chain from the smallest investors who are looking at storm clouds on the horizon all the way up to the strategic investors who will actually bring this to the largest patient populations possible. So as we start looking at the intended and unintended consequences, it was never the intention of anyone I talked to in DC to limit innovation. But what we're already seeing on the front lines is that there are storm clouds that are going to make it that much harder to innovate. No. Yeah, and, it, and Joan, it, 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 it directly affects the innovation in, you know, there's nothing kind of more fundamental to healthcare than taking a pill. And, you know, that's what the small molecules are versus a needle versus biologics. And they all play a role. But, you know, the tweak here is to, is to move the nine-year exception to 13, make it 13-13 for both the pill and the, and the needle-based drugs. I mean, there's, 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 there's no reason why you would want to steer all the investment away from no, basically novel development of better better pills. I mean, we, we how many of us would rather take a pill than, a, than, a, than an injectable, you know, or, a, or an IV, you know, <laughs> just think about cancer care, like, you know, some of these drugs and, you know, that you take a pill once a day and it keeps your cancer at bay. It's so much easier than going in the doctor's office for an IV, um, you know, or, a, or, or an injectable in the, in the leg, like you do with, you know, some of the biologics. Um, so, you know, it, it's just, it's not doing what they want it to do. And as you get elderly, even more so, you know, remembering when to take your, I mean, it's just, um, so, so if I had a magic wand, that's what I would really focus on is this nine versus 13 year exception, um, because it's going to affect, it, you know, in my area, and again, I've been doing developing cancer drugs, it's been a, it's been a decade in diagnostics and a decade, last decade in pharma. Um, it's going to have a big impact on, you know, pill-based drug development for cancer, period. Yeah. Well, and I, I think it also is going to have, and um, there was a question in the chat about the impact on non-drug and biologic, and, and we'll get to that in just a minute. Um, there's also the issue, and, and I've been in some discussions um, where the question was, okay, well, can you develop this drug for PEDS and come yeah. to market on PEDS yeah, first? Let, let's, let's talk about that, Joan, actually. That's an important, I got that question. I put a blog out there that kind of went viral on this topic, just really, this, that this is affecting, you know, innovators who are out raising money right now. And I just used, you know, my work as an example. Um, but I had a question, you know, a good question. Someone said, well, why don't you just develop for the pediatric cancer market? 
And then once you get approved, then you develop the elderly. And so it, ironically, the way it's written, it even more disincentivizes you to do that because if you start the clock, your first approval, let's say, let's say you do have a pediatric, and my, our last drug is an, an amazing pediatric drug. If you Google pediatric track drug, you see incredible responses. And we, we witnessed them, you know, these patients, these babies that had just awesome responses to the, to the drugs that were approved. Um, but if you get approval at nine years, and you only have nine years to go, you're not going to then go spend the time to develop a drug for the elderly, you know, because also it would actually erode your your revenue on that orphan drug for your the way it's written. It says the only indication is that orphan drug. So mm -hmm. you worked, you know, you worked really hard. You got this amazing drug approved. You're one of a hundred companies that actually did this, and um, you, you know, and then you say I'm gonna I'm gonna destroy that um, ability to successfully deliver this drug to to patient to to the pediatric population because I'm gonna then I'm gonna take a risk that I'm gonna develop for the elderly. I only have maybe four or five years left of that nine years. And you would actually lose your exclusion on the orphan drug. So it it even even the way that's written, you're gonna do that. But but drug development doesn't work that way. I mean, and and frankly, the while we like to hear about the pediatric drug development, the massive number of cancer cases are our elderly population. It's a, it's a disease of the aging, it's an odds game that you know, the older you get, the more likely you're gonna have mutation, more likely you know that you're gonna be fighting a battle with cancer as you get older. So, you know, it is a disease of the elderly. So it's really almost a red herring to talk about the, the pediatric. We, we as an industry spend a lot of time on pediatric patients. And I think we should be proud of what we've done. There's more work to do, but cancer is a disease of the elderly. So this is just almost, really just almost a, you know, they absolutely can't do that. And, and but ironically, the bill is going to do the, have the opposite effect. It's, 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 it's gonna disincentivize you to, to get a first approval in pediatric and then go, and then go broader after that. So um, a couple of other, we've just got, you know, about 10 minutes left. So I wanted to touch on some of the other unintended consequences and also some of the questions that are coming up in the chat. Um, one of the questions that came up was, um, how does this impact the non-drug um, and biologic markets? And from a the letter of the law, it doesn't, right? This is specifically to allow Medicare to negotiate prices for Part B and Part D therapeutics. Now, I'm going to take off my, this is the letter of the law, and I wanna talk about the precedent that we just set in the United States. We just set a precedent by law that says that if the federal government feels that it is imperative, that um, it control and sets the prices for private industry, right. it can do that. And if you don't want to play, they'll put you out of business. Yeah. just. Only 65% of your total sales for that product. Going up to 95%. Yeah. I mean, it's just. So, so basically, it's if, if you don't pay, play, you're out. My yeah, the other thing, Joan, I think in, in diagnostics, you know, and I spent 10 years there. I built the, I built the bioinformatics department for Quest. I've been, I spent a lot of time in that space, but I got out of the diagnostic space because of a change in law, the patent law. It really changed the, the ability to innovate and bring new tests to market. And I moved to pharma drug development 10 years ago. Um, so, you know, I, I think that's a good example that these kinds of shifts, pay attention, even if you're, you feel like you're very far away from the commercial side of things, it, it can affect your careers. But, um, you know, the other thing in diagnostics is that the, you know, a lot of the diagnostic companies are, are a lot of their revenue, um, especially when they're early on, comes from pharma partnerships, um, companion diagnostic based drugs, um, things like that. So I can, I can guarantee you a lot of that is small molecule work. Um, so I can guarantee you that there will be an effect on a lot of that funding that, that you use to basically get your overall diagnostic test on the market, um, you know, is, is going to be at risk. So um, I wouldn't um, just say your diagnostics, we're not, we're not going to be impacted by this. You're going to see a change 
in how pharma approaches those partnerships with diagnostic firms. And I think, you know, as we look at medical devices, you know, imagine if we could create a medical device that would start to, you know, get, make such an impact in the lives of patients that it gets on the radar. Yeah, it's, okay. Gonna, you know, on the, it's a new hit, it's, it's a hit list based rule. You know, it's basically your, you know, so the pattern would, would, could get applied over there. I think I think Joan, the thing that's so hard is you know, and, and I don't think the average person understands this. I I that how risky and and how high you know this is a this is a mountain climb. Drug development always is. I tell people, I say, look, you know, if you have a room full of people like me that have 30 years of drug development experience, you know, raise your hand if you successfully cured cancer in mice, and like everybody's hand goes up. You know, it's like yeah. 10 yeah. times. You know, if they, they even ask you like, why are you asking that question? You obviously aren't even from the industry. But then you say, oh, raise your hand if you have a successful cancer drug. And you, know, and you look around the room of, of 50 or 60 people like me, maybe I'm, I'm mid-career, that have 30 years. So that's, that's a lot. That's 900 years of, of work. And you'll see three or four or five hands go up. You know, I have one successful drug in my career. I played a small part in that. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm hope, hoped another one, but that's, that's kind of the reality. And so when, with that framework, and then you say, we are going to cut the, we're going to limit the upper end opportunity here. Um, you know, the whole industry is built on the hope that you will get a, a cure for something done. And so if you say, no, sorry, that cure is only worth 50% of what we thought it was going to be. You think that isn't going to have an effect? You know, and the other thing is, I mean, two other things. One is that you've got a list of drugs, you know, say it's 50, you know, it look, it look, if you, Look at the look at the those basically are the profits for the industry. I mean, there there's not a lot left when you start to do 15, 10. You're 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 pretty much at all the all the reason why we invested 20 years of work. You know, the the, the top selling the top 50 drugs account for most of the revenue um, for the industry. So this is an interesting one, and I I just I, I'm surprised, Joan, how many people just said, you know, Steve, I I'm really just not paying attention. This is just more saber rattling. I don't see this effect, and I. I will tell you, this is kind of like 20 years ago in, in diagnostics. People were like, oh, there's some patent law changes. You know, how much is this really going to affect us? And it it had a huge effect on innovation in diagnostics. So I just encourage you, pay attention. Don't read the whole bill, but but really think through what this is going to do. And I, I just really hope we can get, you know, at minimum the nine year, the nine instead of nine years for small molecules, at least make it 13, 13. So, and that's, you know, part of the discussion in D.C., you know, at the time was, well, we can give you nine and nine. And obviously that, you know, didn't work because of, of the long tail on biologics. So so that's a really good lead in into one of our, our questions or actually a combination of questions that have popped up in the chat as we um, wrap this up, which is what comes next. Um, as we start to see the unintended consequences materialize, okay, it's one thing to run around anywhere like Chicken Little and say that the sky is falling. But on the other side of it, as we start to build a body of evidence of this is how much innovation was happening before this change went into effect, this is how much is going out now. Um, you can't use drug approvals, okay? The impact is not on the drugs that are in the pipeline, and CBO, you know, supported this. It's not the drug that's three, four, five years away from approval right now. They're, they are so committed, okay, that there's no turning back. It's the drug that is coming out of a research institute, a university, a small business, our investments at the NIH, it's those new medicines, those new treatments and cures. And that we may not see for a decade as the impact. So the stories of patients and the stories of innovators will become extremely important. And that's why, you know, what comes next? Well, yes, bio will be beating the drum in DC and pharma will be beating the drum in DC. 
and there will be lots of lobbyists running around the hill on both sides of the discussion saying these are the things we have to fix. Now I'll tell you a little secret. Uh, our elected leaders do rely on those people because they can't know everything about any, everything. And so if they are fact-based you know, sources, they appreciate getting the data from those people because they are experts on their perspective. But what really makes a difference is the voices of people like you and me. The people like Steve that are in the trenches and are now experiencing the impact of this policy. The patients who may or may not feel that what we can deliver to them today is sufficient. It's when those voices speak with our elected leaders at the district office in their um, DC offices, going to conferences where our elected leaders are speaking and sharing their stories. It's the stories of the people that make the difference. And that's why we kind of started this conversation today. Now, many of you have heard me on my soapbox before. Um, we have to fix our healthcare system. As an economist, I can tell you, we have a population driver which we can't change. Okay, the baby boom is aging. There is nothing we can do about it. That's a lot of people we have to take care of. And by the way, the generation behind them is 30% smaller, which is what's causing this price pressure on the budget. But as we continue to work forward, we have to look holistically at the entire system. Because the level, it's not just what the drug or biologic manufacturer charges. There are multiple layers of overhead between the distributors, the PBMs, the pharmacies, the hospitals, and all different layers in between that get layered on top of what we look at as the drug cost, which causes this problem. And until we start to look at the entire system, okay, probably starting with the PBMs, um, because they're actually, those companies are actually bigger than the drug companies. Um, so that's a good place to start. Um, until we start looking at the system holistically, what happens is it's like when you were a kid and you squeezed a balloon, it's smaller on this side and it's bigger on this side. We need to stop squeezing the, saloon, the balloon. We need to get everybody around the table. And we need to have conversations about how we reduce costs because we have to reduce costs. How we ensure that the patients are taken care of because that's our prime objective. And how we do it in a way that we don't destroy our current innovation, health innovation sectors and health delivery sector. So if I can summarize in one word, what comes next is we all need to start telling our stories. And Steve, I wanna thank you today for rearranging your schedule. Good job, I know it's super busy to join me and share some of those stories with our community.